Hello and welcome back to Sex, Drugs, and Epigenome with Dr. C. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this again, Dr. C. So excited to be here on day what it seems like 100 of quarantine land. Yeah, it's, uh, it's still, well, they're just starting to open up some, I guess they call it stage one in a couple, in a multiple, multiple states in trying to get businesses back to function to some degree and kind of work out this social distancing and look at seeing, you know, what's the potential resurgence of disease here, which I think you will see some bumps in numbers for a little bit of time again. And that may put some fear into the public again. And it's really a matter of how people handle it. And, you know, what, uh, again, I, I think it's going to come down to just being smart about who is isolates themselves. And um, as we kind of understand that the healthy part of the population really rarely is, is affected by this, but they may be carriers. And mm -hmm. it's really the, unfortunately, the people that have the comorbidities of the, the different diseases and elderly and obese and diet, diabetes and those kind of things just don't bode well with this virus. And, and uh, so those, you know, those are the people that have to just be more aware of the, of, I think of protecting themselves mm -hmm. and then other people being courteous of watching out for them also, you know, what I, I really, uh, I really think that's what it's just going to be coming down to more an awareness mm -hmm. and, and hopefully we can move both agendas ahead and, in dealing with the disease while getting businesses back in, in, in gear and understanding that we, we do have control in working against the spread of this disease. We just all have to be very smart about how we do it. And I, I think we can do all that. I think it can all be done um, and prepare ourselves for what's coming here in the fall and, or, you know, the fall winter period when we know the virus is coming back and we know the influenza virus will be around also. So that's kind of the double whammy of is the system going to be able to handle mm -hmm. what's coming. And I, I think we can, I think we really can if everybody's ready to, to do all the right things. And, mm -hmm. and, and what's, I think, I think what's real, what, what we're not, we're not putting into the equation here in, in realizing is that now because of this awareness, I really think we'll have a better control of the influenza virus also. I think, I think these methods of wearing a mask, social distance, washing our hands, just to, just things that we weren't really paying attention to before. I think that's going to make a tremendous difference. And, and I, I think that's what the potential of how we win it, um, the best that we can in moving forward with life, but understanding life's going to be a little different in, in being more self-aware and positioning ourselves um, with knowledge. You know, that, that's the key is people having all the knowledge they can and making smart decisions. Absolutely. Um, if you missed last week's episode, it was definitely a, a one that you want to go back and listen at high speed because it is, if you don't have the time for it, it's worth the time because we talked in great detail about just not only the things that you can do to prepare your immune system for it, but you went into talking about the people that this is affecting the most are folks with weakened immune system or less than efficient immune systems. And so that's, what you've been preaching this entire time and uh it, it makes complete sense to me anyway um, just as a recap we talked about these amazing this amazing super nutrition that i have waiting for me whenever amazon decides to ship it out my god i think that's the thing i miss the most is free is the two-day shipping um, but the my ketone esters are in the mail we talked about that he went into the dr steve's went into the science of it uh, he went into like just how he takes it and the various types. So definitely something that you want to hit. Uh, we also talked about mental health in this time. 
and how, um, how some of the things that you have um, under your sleeve to help your patients deal with mental health as anxiety, as these things have increased. Um, so all of those things are good. We also touched upon how to deal with these springtime allergies that we are, we're, I'm personally dealing with now. Um, it is, it is certainly a, a jam packed episode. I highly recommend taking, taking a peek. Um, but let's get into what we have for you guys today. I'm super excited about this one. If you're anything like me, working out is going to be a little more difficult, right? Especially if you're living in a smaller space. Um, I'm certainly trying to do what I can, but I have noticed that my joints have been hurting out of nowhere. Like my wrists hurt because I'm on the, in front of the computer all day where I've never had a problem with this before in the past. And I think it's because I was exercising regularly, walking to work and all these things. And now I'm, there's none of that until recently. But you were mentioning, and this wasn't even a, a staged thing, Doc, but you were mentioning how, how important muscle mass is for preventing disease. So I would love for us to get started on that topic right there. Well, yeah, so um, I think muscle mass is everything to the, it's a bank. It's currency. It's, it's a bank and currency of health. I look at it as the, the muscle you have holds the keys, multiple keys to um, signaling agents that are sending out messaging to the brain, to the heart, to the gut, uh, to your bone, to your liver, to your kidneys, to help control the positive messaging of, of cell efficiency. And myokines are actually muscle-derived peptides. And they're signaling agents that we, you know, you know just, let's just make it, let's make a, um, just a comparison of, if you have someone who, if you have someone like you're like you're saying you're sitting around you're not doing as much well you're not stimulating muscle but your diet probably hasn't changed you're probably eating the same you were and i guarantee you you're making more fat and not i don't want to say that's bad okay cuz i'm not saying you're fat karen cuz i would never say that and cuz i know you're in great shape you're a gentleman <laughs> but but we know that that increased adipose tissue um, produces pro-inflammatory agents mm -hmm. in the body. So, so those are called adiptokines, adipokines. Okay, and so that's like this. I'm I'm always you know I'm always about when I try to describe things. I always try to talk about like the seesaw effect or the yin and yang effect. Well. I'm giving you the yin and yang of there's fat because you're sitting around and doing nothing and it causes pro-inflammatory signals and those wreak havoc on the body and they lead to disease and lead to dementia and everything that we can imagine. And then there's muscle. So if we're building muscle, muscle produces what are called myokines. Mm -hmm. So you have the myokines and you have the adipokines. And these myokines where we know the muscle produces probably over five to 700 of these that we're, we haven't even touched the surface of understanding all of them. And we've probably studied and know pretty well, maybe 60 to 100 of them. And it is just so amazing as we start looking down that road um, at how important these myokines are and uh, important in um, in having everything to do with the health of the heart, um, the health of the bone, you know, the health of um, uh, of the brain, and and that and and really getting down to what I'm always preaching and talking about, and that cell efficiency, uh, the the really. It really gets down to they're intricately involved in the efficiency of the cell utilizing energy and 
and being the most efficient it can in, in producing um, ATP and NAD um, and coacetyl A and um, NADPH. It's, it's all about these redox um, nucleotide cofactors that are so important in controlling uh, the cell's uh, function. So muscle has everything to do with that. And, and here, here, if we go back to an example of where you brought up diets and so forth, well, we know that, um, so amino acids, let's back up and let me just say, your muscle is a big pool of amino acids. And amino acids are, when they're linked together, they make peptides or they make proteins. And it's not like we make these, you know, there are some amino acids that we can produce out of the amino acids that we, we take. Um, through food and so forth. But for the most part, amino acids are a pool that are just specific to when the body needs something as far as an amino acid to start making things, it goes to muscle to get it, okay? So muscle has to be replenished. And that's why diet is important and protein in diets is important because we wanna replenish muscle with amino acids. Well. Think of this, if we buy the fact that maybe the Western diets are pretty bad because they're more, we take in more acidic type of maybe too much protein and not enough vegetable, which is the alkali part of this, you, you, you have to balance the acidic and alkali part of the diet. And if it's a little more acidic than it is alkali, the the kidney has to make up for that. And what does it do? It goes right to muscle and it pulls out some amino acids like glutamine to produce uh, 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 ammonia. And that balances the pH. So there's no pH problems, but there is a net acid load that's increased. But what I'm saying is you're stealing from muscle and that's never a good thing. And that's how that's how disease progresses because we start stealing things from muscle where muscle is so important in so many other things that it does for the body. So resistance exercise and building muscle, I think is just as important as good cardiac um, type of activity. And that's why I'm a proponent of both. Um, and I've always been a proponent of both. I think you can't have one with the other. And that's the other, you know, the yin and the yang of there's aerobic and there's resistance. But if you can do them together, you really get the magic of both of those working together. So, that yeah. Is, that is amazing stuff. Um, Doc, you said so many tidbit, magical tidbits, and I, I want to just make sure that we all, we are all following. Um, okay. It almost sounds like you're saying that if you're in this like unhealthy diet or lifestyle where you're not really active or moving around, the first place that you're going to see that, the first like indicator that things are not as they should be is the loss of muscle. Would that well, be- Well, sure, it's absolutely, it's the same. Yeah. It, and let me just, let me just go to, to make this another analogy. That's exactly what happens with diabetes. I mean, it's, it's muscle is the big, is the big utilizer of glucose. And so if, so muscle is the first thing affected with insulin resistance and diabetes. So your muscles not utilizing glucose, right? So, so muscle, everything. And, and that's just a little known fact is, so if a diabetic has problems with, with glucose, what all diabetics will tell you and what they know is even if they're taking insulin, uh, some type of a medication to improve their insulin, if you exercise, that negates any need for any medication at that time because your muscle will take in glucose at that time. That tells you how important and how amazing this system is where all of a sudden, you know, you've got someone who's insulin dependent a dependent diabetic or, or who's turned into uh, uh, or maybe isn't even that significant, but is a type two diabetic, everybody will tell you that is a diabetic that if they exercise, they don't need to use as much insulin. They, 
they're able to um, they're able to dampen the amount that they use during that period of time because the muscle has the ability to bring in glucose at that time. That's a powerful messaging system right there for people to realize. This all ties, I'm sorry, I was muted for a second. This all yeah. ties in together with what you've been, what we talked about the last episode with the ketone esters, like pro, because glucose is the first thing that's been taken away, instead of taking it from a muscle, take it from a super nutrient. Yeah. Oh, yeah. geez. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is, it's all coming like full circle. It's an interesting kind of <laughs> conversation. So, so, you know, when you talk about diets and things, it's why one of the, it, it's like you could talk, you know, it, it, we've talked about Mediterranean diet and we talked about ketogenic diet and we talked about um, uh, 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 paleo diet, mm -hmm. carnivore mm -hmm. diet. Well, when I look at, like, like, let's say I look at an older person in their 60s, 70s, and so forth, I don't think about any of those diets. I think about just protein mm -hmm. because I know those people are all sarcopenic. They are mm -hmm. losing muscle. And my number one goal wow. has nothing to do with diet uh, as, a, as we look at it. It's all about building muscle because if I'm building muscle through a higher protein diet, and, I, and I'm paying attention at the same time to trying to keep that not being too acidic. I, I realize ways that I can work. I know they're not gonna get enough vegetables, so I can do things by altering, you know, adding bicarb, things like that. But what my focus is building muscle because if I start building muscle, then I have a basis to a platform I can work for forward with with all those patients in improving their health. And, and there's, there's no argument there. No one can make an argument with that. No one, or if they try to, they don't understand metabolism and they don't understand the significance of, of muscle to, um, uh, in, in setting the balance at least uh, for, for just locomotion. I mean, what, what's the number one complaint of older people? It's harder to get around. It's, they don't have the, they don't have the uh, uh, the endurance, right. uh, and that's they fatigue easier. It's because their muscle they're losing muscle mass, and that you know they required before, or they were their their body was used to getting around. They've lost some of it, so the muscle has to work harder, and it doesn't have that amino acid pool that it, that it started with. It it's all very it all makes sense. So if I just start by adding muscle uh, by amino acids, it makes a difference. And it, and here's how, this is how simple it is. So when I talk about getting collagen into people yeah, and collagen, isn't like taking away protein, but it, it collagen is all about a bunch of amino acids that are important. Well, just that group of amino acids can build muscle. I mean, think about that. That's, that's a, that's it, besides working on repair and all the things I know that are important in, yes. in, 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 uh, in the health of a patient with arthritis, those kind of things. We know that just collagen itself helps with building muscle mass. That this, those are some big messaging signals there to tell you. So, so I've gone full circle from you know, where we've talked about different diets, but then in an elderly person, there's a the primary focus. Yeah. It's all about keeping muscle. Well, what if we back up and back down the trail to when you're in your thirties and that is your primary focus of just maintaining or building muscle. You have a lot better opportunity of keeping that muscle and, and having routines that are already built in. So when you get older, you've got that muscle mass that you need to sustain. And I will tell you from a, from a sports medicine side, as, and as an orthopedist, where I'm around muscular skeletal disease every day, I will absolutely undeniably make this statement that muscle mass is everything when you start getting older. And it changes the landscape of what people are capable of doing. Um, just with activity, 
Now, I'm just talking about activity. Mm -hmm. I haven't even talked about all the great things it does for your heart and your brain. And, and so the, I, I think that messaging is so significant. And, and, and the things it does for your immune system. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it has everything to do with, uh, uh, with this thing where we're talking about trying to make the immune system stronger and upregulating it so the innate and the adaptive immune systems work in tandem together to, well, guess what? Muscle mass has everything to do with that mm -hmm. because of the signaling that, that takes place. And it, it's quite, you know, muscle contraction, when contraction of muscle happens, that's when these myokines are released. Mm -hmm. So, so even, even aerobic activity releases myokines, but resistance exercises release even more and, and different types of myokines. And, and I think that's a, your, that's where you're starting to, the research now um, in that field of just myokines and, and how we're now looking at myokines for muscle uh, or for cancer. You know, why, why do we see people who are, who've done a good job in continuing resistance type of exercises? Why are those people having lower rates of cancer? You know, what, what is that? That that's like, what? You mean there's another, here's another form of exercise. You know, we know exercise has everything to do with that. Um, but specifically resistance exercise uh -huh. makes that much of a difference. Absolutely does. That is, that, that's big stuff. And, and I would, I would even argue that um, muscle mass and, and maintaining and building it is the absolute goal, certainly for elderly, your, your elderly folks, but also even for the younger folks, like you, you mentioned, like develop the, er, the early, early on, develop the good habits that build your muscle in order to have that muscle when you're older. So it's, it's your, you know, preventative care as well as the treatment itself. Well, it, it, and here's something to, that you could take home here. So, so all the people that unfortunately are getting struck with this disease, when you get ill and you have to, your whole system kind of, it, you're, you've got to look at it like all of a sudden as you get ill, because the immune system is revved up and the cells are revving up to feed the immune system, where do you think they're pulling from to, to get more glucose? They're getting glucose, but they're also, they have to make glucose. Your cells can make it by amino acids. It's, you've got this big amino acid pool, so it's gonna go to muscle to, to take those amino acids. So if you have a bigger pool of amino acids, you've got a better base to help that immune system fight what's happening here. So it's not just fat, it's not just glucose, it's protein. And protein is really broken down into amino acids and it's all about amino acids that are building blocks for what the body needs to build and fight disease. So you're much better off going into any situation of um, any surgery or trauma or unfortunately COVID virus process if you've got better muscle mass, I guarantee you, you've got a better chance at being more, more uh, appropriately ready immune system fight that disease. The logic makes total, total sense. <laughs> I mean, everyone is losing muscle right now, so stop it from happening. Doc, can you, can you name out some um, resistance training uh, type of exercises for those folks who are less attuned with the types of exercise that, that are out there? Like what is resistance training? Are you talking about like bands and you're just like weights and things like that? So that's a great question. And that's what makes this so beautiful with training. It, it just makes it so, it's why you've got so many people interested in being trainers and certified strength coaches, which is which we don't have enough of, they're, they're so valuable. If you have the ability to work with these people, you know, these people, this is their lives, they're dedicated to talking about things that I'm, I have the luxury of talking about. These people are there with you doing these type of activities. They're all amazing. They all have different approaches, which makes it even better because they'll tell you, as I will tell you, there is not one approach. When somebody, if somebody's gonna tell you that there's one approach to this, 
um, I would be a little careful. It's like, yeah, there is a one approach, but there are many approaches that work for people. And that's, that's what's wonderful about these people that are trained to do this. They find out what works for you. It, it's, it's that's if you have the ability to work with these trainers, uh, take all the advantage you can. And even, I would even say, you know, you, if, if you can't afford it, you may have a period of time that you could do it for say a month or six weeks and then do some intervals of that with them during the year. You don't have to go all the time with them, but I really think you should take advantage of that. Right. Oh um, yeah. Oh yeah. And because, because this is where, this is where the fun, you got to make it fun and you've got to understand there's so many ways to work with muscle. So older people, for advantage, for instance, they're, those are the first people who will tell you, well, Dr. Seeds, I can't lift weights. And I go, of course you can't. I'm not going to talk about lifting weights. I'm going to talk about working with bands. Um, I, did, I did a lecture, oh my gosh, 15 years ago, uh, one of my first. I used to do lectures for, uh, for the like silver, what's called silver sneakers now, but for a group of older people who were just interested in exercise. And I had a very large following. I had probably over a hundred people that come to my lectures, a, a very large amount, um, who were all very active people. And we, we, we started out, it was discussions like this, and I would teach them about nutrition and all very interested in all those kind of things. And then I took it a step further where I bought them all bands. I brought these bands in one day and I was, I wanted to teach them resistance exercise because they used to, all of them thought they couldn't, they couldn't work on muscle, that it would be a bad thing to do. Well, you can take bands that are just stretchy bands and you can absolutely start with anybody with those bands and get a decent resistance type of exercise that, that with, that you can start working on muscle and older people with because you're, you're trying not to injure, get them injured, and you know, realize they haven't worked with any type of weights in a long time. That's a great beginning. And it's something you can make, you can make very fun workouts with and, and they can accomplish it. They can accomplish it. And remember, what's a big thing with all of this? It's self accomplishment. It's doing something different and new that you haven't done for a while and having some routines that you can constantly go back to and feel good about. You know, how many people tell you they feel great after exercise? Uh, most everybody will tell you they feel pretty darn good after they've done something. It's just, right? yes, no, am I Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Doc, you are one of the most disciplined people that I've ever met. Um, but you have to give us some pearls of wisdom for, the, for, for us less disciplined folks who are getting there. Uh, but how do you how do you go out to the gym after a long long day? Your day is sometimes goes into the night. Like how what what's your motivation like? Like so so this is that's a great question, and this is how I mean this is how we raise this is how Joss and I raise our kids. It's 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 you have to you you know it miss miss this might sound cliche, but you have to demand excellence out of yourself and you no one's going to be around to shake your hand or pat you on the back or you're just that just isn't going to be there it has to come from you and you you have to be you have to take the steps to just push yourself to where you're you know, I, I have those days all the time where I don't want to do something. And that's your, your brain is so smart at, at how it tries to get out of doing stuff. Your, your, your number one enemy is yourself. But if you just say to yourself, well, you know what? I may not want to do it. I'm, it's just, I'm just doing it. I'm not going to think about, if you start thinking about why you can't do it, I'm going to guarantee you, you're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. But if you do, I'm going to do it. The more you then try to make it into a routine, then the easier it does become in being part of your life and how you fit it in. Um, but you just, you know, it, you're not going to have 
people around telling you, hey, you have to do this. And, and so, um, sometimes that's what people feel they need. But I think you, I think you sell yourself short. I think everybody needs to, I think everybody has it. They just, they just don't realize they have it inside of where they can say, okay, you know what? I think for just pick a week or two and just say, you know, I'm going to do something that is maybe out of the norm of what I normally would do. And I think that's it. I think people just get caught up in just norm, you know, the norm of it's easy to be in the norm. It's difficult to be outside of the norm. I always try to be in the difficult places. That's what I try to do because then I know, then I know I'm actually doing something. If I get too complacent and too comfortable somewhere, then something's wrong. And I have to I then adjust. That. That's probably why we get along, Doc. Um, the tag, <laughs> the tagline to our Facebook group is "Complacency equals death." It's a little dramatic, but <laughs> it's because I believe it. Well, I don't think Joss and I haven't we haven't threatened the lives of our children <laughs> yet. Um, but that isn't out of the playbook. Um, but you know, it's like. Even like Joss will come in sometimes, like when I'm working, like I get caught into, I get caught into routines of where I might just go and not realize I've gone for a long time working on something. And she'll come in and she'll go, aren't you working out today? And I'll go and she'll just give me that little smile like, oh, she, or she'll, or she'll say, you know, you look smaller or you look, you know, just think that. <laughs> Just ways to just she knows how to get to me and go. Okay, you're right. I need to let's let's take a break. Uh, it's time to do my stuff and and that's why you try to do things. I mean, I I do con I do things unconventionally. Um, like my son was just giving me trouble the other day, saying, "Dad, you spend so much time in the gym where you could probably get it done in 20 minutes, and you're out there for an hour and a half." And it's like, well, that's because I bring my computer. I bring my, st I don't just try to, maybe it would be good to focus on one thing, but I just can't do that. So I realize what my weaknesses are. My weaknesses are, I have to be doing a lot of things um, to keep myself engaged. So I find it very fulfilling. Well, you have to keep your five brains engaged with five different things. Five brains. <laughs> I like that. But, is, but if I'm out there yeah. working on my material while I'm working out, it just, they're, they're both so powerful together. It just is, I, I can't explain it to you. It's just another way of me learning in a different environment. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also me in another way. What it does is it gets me prepared working out. So instead of me taking a, stimulant workout stimulant like jacked or all these things people take to get in a gym and work out hard i want my sympathetic parasympathetic system i want to be more in a parasympathetic state where i'm just relaxed and i'm i don't want to be i don't i don't want to be too i don't want to be jacked i want it i want my level of of uh, commitment to when I get ready to work out, I'm there in the calmest place I can be. And that's mm -hmm. how, if I'm doing work like that, it keeps my mind away from, okay, hey, I gotta get ready for this lift. And it just, it seems to level me out quite a bit. And, and we know, um, you know, we know that does make a big difference if in training, especially if you're into resistance training, uh, you don't want to be too much in a sympathetic state because that just that can have a significant effect on the lift and and it can actually lead to burnout faster um, when you train a lot and uh -huh. and that's a that's a problem people get into. Unfortunately, a lot of these young kids who go to these uh, go to the, the these uh, supplement stores and get all of these like pre workout type of drinks yeah to, to feel the edge to feel Right. Um, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. Wow. Oh. Be because that sets your your parasympathetic sympathetic uh, mode in the wrong place. And and sympathetic I, I, doc, it's not like feeling sorrow for something or empathy for something. This is something else, right? 
Yeah, sympathetic nervous system is, I'm talking more about getting, like increasing epinephrine and adrenaline. And those are things you don't want at a high level. The, the parasympathetic is more the acetylcholine, it's the vagal nervous system, it's, it's dampening down things. So, so you're in a better, you're, you're in a much better mode to fire more muscle mass um, cohesively together. And I will tell you, it makes a tremendous, it's, we're like in, in my, in my research side of things with working with athletes, we're very, very focused on building parasympathetic tone because we know we improve recovery. We improve, um, training, um, and there are devices out there now where you can try to measure those things. Um, it can get really deep in discussion about that. Mm -hmm. And that's, a that's a very, that's a real thing. That's uh, so that, that is freaking fascinating. Like I've never, ever heard that. And in fact, I used to, when I would go to the gym a lot, take the, the pre-workout things and it's all, it's most, it's a lot of caffeine for one. Um, but you do end up just feeling like kind of, for me, it just made me a little lightheaded after a while. Well, well yeah. And that's why I tell people the best pre-workout drink you can have is my like amino drink I talk about. Yeah. Or just having, just having a small cup of coffee out there you can sip on where you're not going crazy with mm -hmm. that type of pre-workout adrenaline. And, and in fact, you know, with coffee, there's some other things that happen there, but um, it's, it's setting the right expectations for muscle and workout modes um, to, to make, you know, that I'm in it for the longevity. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate to be, to be, to have been training since I was a young, young person. And I've always had the uh, uncanny, I guess, knowledge of, hey, it is about longevity. It is about recovery. I think if I work on those things, then I'll be able to get stronger. I'll be able to build, you know, a, 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 a decent physique um, and, uh, and, and do the things I want to do. Um, as I've always said, it's, you know, it's about, um, it's not about longevity, but it's about the time you have. And that time you have, the more muscle mass you have, the more you're going to be able to do things and be active. And so that becomes very important for me as I get older and older too. You know, even if I have my five brains you call, I have, I want the muscle mass, um, to be there to carry those five brains around. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and they must be heavy brains. <laughs> it's so funny. The Dr. C's team behind the scenes. Dr. C's always like very well put together with a bow tie. He did one video that, that ended up exploding and he wasn't wearing the bow tie. And even his wife, Joss, we were having a discussion about how we think the reason that is, is because you had a t-shirt on and people can see your muscles. So that <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, we're going to have him take the bow tie off. Um, I was hoping it'd be today to want our muscle conversation, but um, yes, Dr. Seeds is very, very muscular. Um, we have on his social media, check him out, um, a, a video of him flipping over a 300 pound tire with this giant Rottweiler just trying, just like attacking the tire, trying to help him out. It's a fantastic video, but there's also a great video. Oh, by the way, we have the recipe for the amino acid drink that Dr. Steve just mentioned. It's got like six different ingredients in there. We have it all listed out on his social media. So follow him, uh, Dr. William A. Seeds MD. Uh, you can find him there uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and on Twitter. Um, one more note about your social media. There is another video on there and definitely go check this out. 80 year old stroke survivor she's just the, the cutest cutest old, well, woman that you, that you can see and dr sees has this great relationship with her she um allowed herself to be filmed throughout your treatment of her when she came in wheelchair bound uh was told that she was unable to walk again at 80 years old and that's not i think uncommon right doc you probably that, that's that's a common thing that people people might get because they just don't have muscle mass. Is that is that true? They they might get that kind of feedback from from doc, other doctors. Yeah, it just gets it's it's I uh, boy, that's a whole nother discussion. I, I think it's it's touchy. It's, 
it, it, it's people who get lost in the system and get, they just get pigeonholed for, okay, you had a stroke, you had this, this is what your outcome is going to be. Um, the doctor's overwhelmed because all he's doing is he's, he's seeing patients in this part of their re, you know, uh, in the early part, but unable maybe to follow them long term because they go to a facility and it, it just, it's, it's lost. It's kind of the, the best thing to say is lost in translation is a lot of people. You, you just can't, I don't think anybody can really appreciate and fathom unless you go through it, the amount of work that has to go into just one person when they've undergone some type of traumatic brain injury or stroke, or um, for that matter, any type of significant um, um, life-threatening process that's changed the whole spectrum of how they live their life and affected other ones around them. It's, it's, a, it's catastrophic when, it, when you think about it and, and how, it, how, much, how, mu how many resources need to be utilized to help those people. And that's where our medical system is totally upside down. Um, you know, it, this gets into don't, I'm sorry I'm bringing this up, but it gets into this whole nursing home aspect right now and why we're mm. seeing this, this, why COVID's just running rampant into nursing homes and what's happening, why people are saying, why are these nursing homes hit like this? And I mean, if you ask me, that's been no surprise to me. I mean, if you've been to a nursing home, it's like, please, please don't ever put me in a nursing home. I mean, it, 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 they're, they're, they're ill-equipped they're they're understaffed mm -hmm. um they're they're overutilized with people our, our, our patients i mean it, it's ridiculous to if you go to these places and think that um you can have one nurse and and all by the way all the people that work in these nursing homes they're superheroes i mean mm -hmm. they're they're amazing amazing people because they have no resources they you rarely find places unless you spend the money for them mm. and and that's the problem it's having all of the resources and money where it should be in helping to take care of people and have these people well um you know well taken care of but those resources are tough and and unless you've been in a facility and seen this you realize that what I'm saying is very, very true. And it's why our healthcare system is so, and nobody pays attention to it because they're not there yet. You know, it doesn't, it, it, it's one of those things that uh, I think if it doesn't affect you now, or you're not aware of it, it's something that really isn't an important issue to you, mm -hmm. but we need to really wake up about that and realize that these facilities are where everybody is going to end up at some point and and you have to realize that um, but no one should have to be on no one with with the resources we have then the knowledge we have we shouldn't have facilities that are understaffed that have that don't have all of the proper you know like ppe and all the things that they they needed uh um, and I could go on and on and on. And it's just, and it's, it's not that they don't try. It's just the money is not there. So they're doing the best job they can to help people where we should be directing a lot more money that way to, to make it, make it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how we just got into all that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> it happens a lot on our conversation. No, but you're bringing up some very, very good points. And unless you've been there or had to go and visit, I mean, nobody wants to visit their grandparents at the nursing home because it it sucks there. It is it is depressing. It's it's sad um, and just an awful place. And uh, I, unfortunately, you know, I've had I've had grandparents who who had to go there just for for medical reasons because the hospital had to kick them out because they were there for too long, and then they had to go into the the uh, nursing home to get that treatment. Awful, 
and there's nothing we could do about it because we we don't have hospital equipment in our homes um and so it, it was just an awful experience and and since then it's been like yeah we we need to do something about this but really what can be done that is a conversation for a whole other day a whole other podcast <laughs> but I, I brought up the the woman from this video that 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 you can watch the stroke survivor, oh, um, yeah, eighty year old yeah. woman, because she was told that she was unable to she would be unable to walk and be wheelchair bound for the rest of her life. But you got her getting off your hospital table, your 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 bed table, and walking around, and yeah. now she's totally mobile. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know, I know it's with a lot of other things with peptides and stuff, but did you also do something with her, her muscles? Did you, did you, did you, did you Abs there? absolutely, absolutely. That was one of our primary focuses was wow. just, was again, turning on the muscle, building a little muscle mass for her and reconnect. It, it, it just had something to do with, has a little bit to do with connectivity of between the brain and the, and the muscle, the brain realizing that the muscle can still be activated and, and some of those things sometimes just get turned off for a while. Mm. And mm. you'd be very surprised how many of these people you see years down the road that you can really make some significant changes in lifestyle. I mean, this lady now, I, I can't remember what her last story was, but she just continues to amaze us with the things. I think she danced with her husband, like for some, they went to a wedding and she was able to dance. And, you know, it was like, when, when you hear those stories, it's like, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a male that is going to have a tear in my eye. I got really <laughs> terrible here. It's like, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me these stories. This is crazy. Um, but those are the things that are, that are amazing that you can help people with. And, and she is, uh, you know, her and her husband were inseparable and, and, and he wasn't satisfied that there wasn't more that could be done. And I want to say it was all serendipitously where maybe it was, he was being treated and he was just happened to say, Hey, you know, my wife is, she's over in a wheelchair and they brought, I, I can't remember how it, it just was kind of, it wasn't like they sent her to us to do that. It was like, he, he kind of inquired and then we're like, well, let us take a look at her. We, of course, this is what we do. It's again, what people don't know can be done. You know, they were in that, they were told that was as good as she was going to get. Wow. And, and they had no idea. Mm -hmm. And boy, to see, to, to see the spark of life come back into people, mm -hmm. that's a privilege. At that, any age. That is a privilege. And that is, you can't put, um, you know, for me, being able to see those kind of things, I feel it, it, I feel blessed that I can actually witness that in life, where where you just give somebody hope and 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 they see it, and then they're doing it, and you're like, wow, that person really did it. And even though that's what we do, and we see it all the time, it never gets old. It never gets old at all, and that's. That's what makes this so cool. And it, and, it, and it comes back to our story about muscle and, and then what they want to know, like, okay, Dr. Seeds, boy, we, this is making sense. I'm getting stronger. I'm work, what can I do now? Oh, well, you could put a little more protein in your diet. You could do this. It's, it's when, when people want information and are seeking information, it makes a big difference instead of me just sitting there and spewing out information because if you, if it's, it just has to, it, it has to be timing mm -hmm. again, you know, it has to, all that has to be at the right time or, or it's information that's really worthless to you. you hmm. know? Now, I, I, you mentioned something earlier in, in our conversation when we first talked and I totally forgot to ask you about it, but I just remember it. And I think it's, it's a little off topic, but it's totally related. You mentioned that the, the muscle kind of gives these signaling agents to all parts of your body, including the brain. So would you say that having good muscle mass will also help to feed your five brains, aka, for those of you who don't have five brains like me, uh, just to get my brain up and going and at its you know, most focused 
state, um, being able to even recall and remember things, retain information. Um, what does that have anything to do with exercise and muscle mass? It sounds like it would be a yes, but I'd love to know why. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Just one from just one reason and it's one reason in itself would be number one that in, that it, it's going to improve blood flow everywhere. Um, uh, just like walking in blue, in, improves blood flow to the hippocampus. Um, that's a just walking for 15 minutes, uh, 15, 20 minutes improves blood flow to the hippocampus. And if that, you know, that's that whole, that's part of the, um, when we, I don't know if we talked about this before with this thing we instituted with a walking program for our elderly in our community. That was one of the primary focuses behind the walking wasn't just for the muscle and and all the things we know it did, but also because of proven studies of how it improves the hippocampus and mm. how it improves blood flow and um, and all those kind of things. So, so I know you asked me a question and I got off. I know that's I got, exactly it. But can you can you explain what the hippocampus oh, is? Uh, the hippocampus is just part of the brain that's important with uh, muscle uh, memory and. Um, short term long term uh it's it's kind of the area we focus on i think the most with uh, with definitely uh, executive thinking um in in how uh in in really what's most important for elderly people in, in having a better short term memory um, mm. and um and cognitive awareness to some degree uh it's just a it's just a very important area also for for stem cell mitigate uh, stem cell reactivation uh, can can occur in the hippocampus um, so it's just a very important part of the brain that we concentrate on um, in difference in improving some of the some of the early functions that are lost in as you get older uh, even even the it's an and it's an area that signals to the rest of the brain too, to the forebrain, uh, to to the temporal lobes, uh, hippocampus. It, it it has a lot to do with messaging also. But so it's just something we look at um, that we know has a significant factor in improving uh, um, uh, elderly uh, function. What about a non-elderly? Fifteen minutes of walking, Absolutely. which I'm about to do. Absolutely. So. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, it's about, yeah. it's why it's, it's why I make such a stink about, um, you know, one of my, one of my thoughts is that we could, we could, so if we had no supplements and we had no control of diet and we had no control of anything, but we could convince people right after they ate, their lunch, their breakfast, their dinner, to just go walk for 15, 20 minutes after that, oh my gosh, we could keep so many people out of trouble with progressing into diabetes. And I mean, just that effort right there can make a tremendous, could do better than any medication or any pill ever made uh, on this planet. That's powerful, Doc. Just, just exercise as the medicine. I mean, I've heard food as medicine. But sure. you're saying you're saying it's exercise as medicine. Maybe even a combination, but exercise is just as important as the food that you intake. Of course, mm -hmm. I, it's well. How many people? I mean, m how many people actually move and do something after they eat? Very, 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 very few. Um, it's always I'm gonna. They're gonna sit down or go back to their desk or mm -hmm. go back to playing video games or who knows what. Mm -hmm. um, but just that change, just that change after you eat, because what you're doing is you're, you're utilizing glucose much better. You're, you're dampening down the insulin response. Um, it, it's, it's all about the metabolic efficiency again. You're controlling how that cell is gonna utilize that energy. So you're giving the cell more of the messaging that you want in, becoming more efficient 
in the flexibility of utilizing the nutrients you've just given it because you've put a stress on the cell. You know, the cell is no different than, you know, we're, we're talking about muscle. This, here's a great way to think about things. We're talking about muscle and we know to build muscle, you need resistance training. If I just went out to the gym and just sat there and did nothing, I wouldn't, wouldn't change a damn thing with muscle. But if I do work on resistance to build muscle, it's going to happen over time. Well, the cell needs a little stress also to, to, fu to function, but to adapt. And if you've just given it the nutrients that it needs, and then you get up and go walk for that 10, 15 minutes, you're stressing the cell to take advantage of the nutrients you've just given them. So you're, you're giving the cell what it really wants. If you do nothing, the cell isn't stressed. It doesn't need to really, it just, it looks at this food. Remember, food are really amino acids, fatty acids, and proteins. So it's not going to have, it doesn't need to really utilize a lot of that flexibility to be efficient. And it's more focused on that glucose side. So, so you're, you're not taking advantage of how brilliant your cells are. Um, and, and really making the most of what that, just that, just what I just told you could change your life. Absolutely could change your life. And that's huge doc. Well, it's true. It's, uh, I, mean, I, I don't have to, I don't have to make it up. I it's, uh, think about it like that though. It's like a weird, like, you, like didn't think of it as a exercise being as a stressor to the cell to get it going. And you're absolutely right. It makes complete sense. Like the cells looking at your food going, all right, I don't need this. <laughs> it's chilling out. <laughs> I, I think it's so, so here's what I think it is. I think it's kind of, I think it's a counter. It's a, uh, I don't know if it's something that's, that's more prominent in the United States, but it has, I've, I've gotten that connotation from like people who, who said, well, you're not supposed to swim after you eat. You're not supposed to go in the water because it's bad for you. And I'm like, what the heck are you talking with? Well, that's an old wise tale. That's just baloney. That's like that, you know, walking in water would be fantastic for you. Or, you know, what the heck do you, where did that come from? And that's actually something that you got passed down through many generations of, Hey, you know, don't go swimming after you eat. You know, oh, that's, yeah. the, that's not good for your stomach or that's not good for your, I'm like, I'm like, what are, what are you talking about? Doc, it's scientifically proven that if you whistle at night, the snakes will come out and bite you. Didn't you know this? Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a Korean old wives tale. <laughs> okay, I knew I missed that Korean paper. I didn't yeah, read that one. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's fact. So. <laughs> okay, that's good to know, Karen. Thank you. You're welcome. No, Doc, this is actually, it makes so much sense. Um, and one thing I did, I actually forgot to wait for your answer on. We were, we were talking about the importance of muscle to the brain. And, we, and then we got off on the, uh, what the hip, hippocampus is and the importance of that. But why is it, and this is like this really, really stupid question, Doc. So I'm just going to preface it by saying, I know it's stupid, but I have to ask. Why are those super, super, super muscular people? Kind of, kind of dumb. Did see what word am I wanting? What word am I wanting? It's, it's just wow. What? It's a wow. little. It's a little. It's a little there, right? It's stereotypical for me to say, but the reason why the stereotype exists is for a reason, right? They call them the meatheads. If that stereotype is there, so but what's the deal with that? Are are we are they building muscle in an artificial way? Is something else happening? Like what's the deal? I'm trying to follow what you just said. Um, uh, You've heard of the term meatheads? Okay. Yeah. And, and so you're saying, so I'm going to tell you some of those people. Uh, I'm going to tell you I know a lot of those. If you're going to call them meatheads, that are brilliant people. Mm. Um, I, I think it's a stereotype that's just uh, it's just a mal it's a stereotype that isn't isn't valid, but 
Uh, it's yeah. like the whistling and the snakes coming out, like Absolutely. an old wives thing. Oh my gosh, there there are so many brilliant um, meatheads, if you want to call them, that I know that know a tremendous about about metabolism and hormones and um, exercise. Uh, but you know, I think you see that everywhere. I I just think that's just a that's a Hollywood thing, maybe, or I don't know. That's that's just. Uh, I'm I'm just not going to agree with that. <laughs> uh, not not at all. Um, but what about but the use think, of steroids for exercise, which happens a lot, right? And creatine and all these things. I don't know if you, I I, I know that you like a little bit of creatine in your amino acid thing, but like some people go balls to the wall crazy, right? Especially with with the folks that do use you know the, the steroids to build muscle. Um, it's it's not natural and it, it, there's so many side effects that come with that right that gotta think that that's where the stereotype happened um, oh, okay so, so you're, t you're talking about like really big big muscle people that that okay so that's yeah. another so so that's another area and i'll tell you those there are some very brilliant people there um those are some people that are just focused on on a different level of training um I will agree with you. I think that th I don't think they're doing the best for cell efficiency. And, and you know, there's, there's that thing again, remember it's doing too much of something mm -hmm. can sometimes be a bad thing. And from a metabolic side, all of those people are in a bad place. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt about that. And they know that too. They're, they're just willing to take those risks because that is their passion in, 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 in pushing forward. And um, there are ways to mitigate that um, to some degree. And actually peptides, peptides are a way of, of helping those people to protect them from hurting themselves. So, so you can, um, I, I've helped quite a few people with, with those type of issues of where they're smart enough to know they're not doing good things for their body but they're also, they've sought out the people to help them. Are there ways I can do things to, to, to mitigate some things I know that may not be good for myself right now? And, and that's a whole nother discussion. And, and is that the right way to go about life? Um, and I'm not here to tell anybody what's right or wrong. It's just not good for your body. And that, yeah. that's what I would say. Um, and I certainly don't, that's not a route that I, you know, that, that's something I definitely don't push that type of training or that type of muscle hypertrophy. Um, I'm talking about just building muscle mm -hmm. mass that's enough um, for, uh, for aging uh, and, and for training too, you know, for exercise. I mean, to, it's because that there, there are all kinds of issues with, with increased muscle mass and the load it puts on the heart. Um, those are known things with hypertension. So those people do have issues with hypertension and insulin resistance and, um, and they pay for it later. Unfortunately, they all, they'll all tell you that, you know, that's I, what I'm telling you is no secret, but there it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that, that some people are just driven to, to push themselves, you know, in that direction. But, but I will, but I will tell you there, there are some very, very, very smart people that, that are into in at that level. Um, I, I have had conversations with people that have blown my mind um, of how intelligent they are, and yet they're destroying their body, um, you know, for the in the long run. And they they realize that. And I guess that's that's the. I don't have the answer for that when yeah. when when they're that smart and they know what they're doing. Um, it's just they're at a different level of training that it's like uh, seeking, um, you know, it's being the best at something. Sometimes you, you give up some stuff to, to, to get there, I guess, and they're willing to take those risks. It's very interesting. Your, your priorities are always, always right there with the same thing. It's, it's the, the efficiency of the cell and the immune system. Um, and that that priority stack for you as a doctor is how you're seeing all the treatments that you give your patients. It's it's just an interesting 
perspective from 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 an MD that I don't think is is common, which is why I find our conversation so fascinating. Uh, but sorry, I took us there. Um, I am filled with with a lot of <laughs> uh, very stupid and stereotypical information, which I hope to bring to light. <laughs> but uh, I want to switch topics now. We've been we've been focusing on muscle. We've been focusing on that stuff for a while. This is a really good segue to talk about the different kinds of kinds of diets. Um, and uh, Dr. Seed has shown me and told me a whole bunch of uh, tricks of the trade on diets, just hearing my struggles of plateauing and all that stuff. Um, and I feel like everyone would love this information uh, because he has such a scientific knowledge of food and nutrients and what it does to your body. So let's start with um, paleo, if you can talk about that. I'd love for you to talk about the diet, um, maybe even like what, how you cycle through the diets because that was like the one thing that i haven't heard before is how you're cycling through it um and when do you cycle through it and and when do you know to stop doing one diet and switch over to the other the so you're right so you bring up some good points and and my philosophy is again it's i really believe the brain and body are very, very smart and intelligent in they adapt to everything. And it's just like training. The, the easiest way I can make people understand this concept is if you go out and you're training and you're trying to build muscle, you kind of go out and do the same routine every time. It kind of gets old and you kind of get to a place of where you can't do any more. You've reached a plateau. Well, that's because muscle has adapted and it's reached an end point of where, okay, this is as far as I'm going and I'm not going to adapt anymore. And it's time to change the routine. And that's what makes, that's what makes the resistance training so fascinating because here, here's an example for you. I haven't done the same routine ever in my whole life. I've, I constantly rotate and change and that, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of different ways of going at exercises. And that may mean, you know, four days a week or five days a week or six days a week or so many repetitions or it's just so many different variables you can change. So that the point I'm making is the same thing works with your brain. When you go and look at something, if you're trying to learn something, if you just try to learn it one way um, and let's just say you try to learn it just by reading it, you're selling yourself short if you don't try to read it and then maybe write it down and then maybe um, visualize it in some other way of, of looking at another source that describes that in a different way. I mean, you really have to go, you have to do different things to get better at learning because your brain adapts again. It's all about adaption and, and, and so you have to mitigate that. Well, it goes the same with diets. I think there are all these tremendous diets out there, but I don't think there's just one diet for one person. And, and I, I, there are very, very, very few people on this planet that stick to one diet their whole life, okay? That's why dieting is such a big business because you see these new diets that come up and, and they're, they're a fad or they're there and, I'm just going to tell you, none of these things were really meant to be lifelong for the most part. Um, and, and there are arguments there. I mean, the Mediterranean diet could be considered something you could definitely do lifelong. Uh, and probably out of all the diets, the Mediterranean diet has the best research to show improved morbidity, mortality, and heart health. Um, and I'll get into that. But, um, but I believe in changing that up. And I believe in doing all kinds of diets and cycling through them um, because of that change. I think adapting, I think you need to do it. I think it's always, you need to change that environment. So I like doing paleo for a while, three or four months. I like doing Mediterranean diet for three or four months. Mm. I like doing keto diet to some degree for maybe two to three months. I like then putting in intermittent fasting for a while. I like mixing up 
ketogenic with paleo. I like so so I get creative as I get very comfortable with all of these diets, and and then I find what my body likes and tolerates well, and then I try to work on again what is my body not. It. Yeah. And then what does my body not tolerate and why? Yeah. And, and that's where you start learning more about your body and your microbiome. And, um, and you, I mean, you make mistakes, you know, you make mistakes and find out that some things don't work well and you've just made yourself feel terrible for a day or two. And, but you remember that and you make note of it and it's, uh, it's again, um, it's a process. So, so the paleo diet is a more heavy protein diet. It's heavier in, you know, in meats and, and, and that's where, you know, in chicken and red meat and stuff, you have to, you have to kind of get past that being very strict on one thing. Uh, and, and this isn't a time really now to talk about why maybe red meat is bad for you or good for you that's another discussion we can totally have. And I think we could do a really good job about it. I think in short periods of time, all of these things can be good for you. Um, and, uh, and so I think there are really some good parts of the paleo I like. Um, it's a more protein based and, uh, and definitely, uh, takes a little bit of the Mediterranean diet of where it's, it's nut based and, um, and, and to some degree, uh, I think, uh, and, 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 and that's, what's really important here is that as you learn these diets, you're able to kind of mix and match them. Like I said, yeah. uh, but, but the paleo diet is, is that is the protein diet. And I think it can be a real important diet when you first start out training. Um, and you're working on if you're you're starting new resistance type of work, um, you're really gonna need that protein load. It's it's a very important thing. Um, mm. um, you can even go as there. I even have people that get so advanced that where they do they do paleo type of eating three days a week, and they do Mediterranean diet eating maybe uh, three days a week, and they have a day of just total fasting of where they do nothing. Yeah. or they do something more ketogenic. It's just amazing how smart people get where they really get very, very smart about this. And, you know, the, the benefits of protein, I think we spent a lot of time on today talking about, well, you can move to the Mediterranean diet, which is more of a, uh, that's, that's more of nuts and fruits um, and, like seafood, um, that the, the, the fat is more based on, um, uh, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated type of fats, more like the olive oil is the big, the Mediterranean diet. I think one of the keys to that is the olive oil. And so I've even taken, I've taken the most important part of that. I like, I really like the nuts you know, Brazil nuts and all these things that have good selenium and magnesium and things that I think are important in getting in a diet. Um, but I think the, uh, the olive oil being this monounsaturated fat is really important because of all the literature we've, we've uncovered that shows how significant this oleic acid is from pressed olive oil. Um, and it goes a little further into what that oleic acid is, but it has such a significant influence on the brain and body function that we're finding that in itself is probably the magic of the uh, Mediterranean diet. So, that is so, so cool. real quick yeah. thought, question for you. Um, yeah. Out of the oils, would you say that one is your like kind of favorite one when it comes to health? Um, when compared to like, cause I've read somewhere about avocado oil being a really healthy substitute to olive oil. And I don't know if you, if grapeseed oil is on your list at all, but that is apparently known as a healthy oil as well. Um, but you would still say olive oil is, is, is your go-to. Yeah. So, I mean, from that, are you talking about like cooking with and things? 
Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you, yeah, olive oil for sure is the, ah. that, that's absolutely, that trumps any of those things you just talked about. A avocado is a great fat though. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a tremendous, so that avocado is big in the ketogenic diet and that's something like, I'll take the avocado and bring it over to the paleo diet and having people with high protein also have high fat too. Um, like good fat, like, like that. And that's where you get people that get very creative with understanding the more they understand their food groups. But I mean, avocado is just amazing with, with, with the, the fat source for that good fat. Um, but the, the, uh, the key to the olive oil is, is really that oleic acid, but then there are other oil, you know, I look at this as, um, the Western diet is really, uh, is really focused more on polyunsaturated fats that are more omega sixes and omega six type of polyunsaturated fats are not really good for you. Like the omega threes are omega threes are what you get out of fish. You know, they're the DHAs and the EPAs. It's the omega three fatty acids that are, that we try to balance. It's remember everybody says I take fish oil. Well, that's a part of, Again, that's another fat that's big in the paleo diet, or I'm sorry, it's well, is part of the paleo, can be part of the paleo diet, can be part of the Mediterranean diet, and can be part of the keto diet. So, so that's a universal type of fat that you do try to work with. And, um, and there are ways, you know, if you can't get it in your seafood, you can get it through um, uh, linolytic acid which is broken down into omega, uh, omega threes, um, that your body can, your body can, can, can change that. Um, uh, and that comes from, that comes from something very simple, uh, like, um, uh, linoleic acid is very big in, uh, walnuts, like walnuts are, if, if you read the studies about walnuts, uh, it's one of the healthiest, one of the best fats that you could absolutely take, uh, because, Walnuts do so much for giving you that the ratio of those of what linolytic acid can be broken down into, but also um, they've done studies to show that these it also can dampen your satiety for eating. So so by eating a uh, like a cup a, a quarter of a cup of walnuts, which is about sixteen halves, have if you talk about walnuts, they're they, they're like a half of a walnut um, and that can uh, that works on the insulin the the what's it called the insulin area of the brain uh, that can, that has an effect on how much you want to eat and it can decrease it can improve satiety so people can lose weight by actually eating walnuts and do at the same time you're putting in really good fat in your body. Um, and then you're adding all these other things people don't know about, like magnesium and uh, potassium, things that are really important that come from walnuts. And so there's been tremendous literature written on this that is just so amazing, and people don't know about it. It's it's nuts. People do not know about it. I have no idea that you knew so much about food and the 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 good chemicals that, that each ingredient has. I had no idea. <laughs> so now when you're telling me that this keto sure. thing is like this super nutrient, I'm like, holy shit, this, this is, I mean, you, you know about the walnuts and all the oils it produces, <laughs> of course. Wow. That this, that's why you're so excited about the keto dresser. My God. Well, it's, it's Karen, if I don't know this stuff, who, who am I, to t how can I be telling, how can I be helping anybody if I don't know? I mean, these are questions I had years and years and years and years ago about, okay, well, what, what are the best things I can put it? Remember, I'm the walking guy. I have to walk the talk. And, and so I want to know, I wanted to know from, from that first day I started reading that amazing book when I was 16 or whatever. Um, I want to know what I'm putting in my body and I want to know what does it have mm. to potentially give me that. Remember, I'm looking for that edge. I'm looking for giving my cell everything it needs because I'm all about optimizing efficiency. So 
it only makes sense. You know, it's people, you hear people say, you know, this is the temple, the body's the temple. And what I put into it is, is just as important. I, I can't put crap in it or I'm going to, I'm going to, the, the temple's going to crumble. <laughs> so do, do you ever cheat? You ever have a cheat meal like a pizza? Okay, you know the answer to that, Karen, because you I was in Koreatown with you and you had me eat some ice cream thing. Ah, that's right. I had it's, you eat a, a fish waffle cone stuffed you, with Nutella and custard. Yeah, but the Nutella, I thought, okay, well, I tried to make, so so if I do cheat, of course I do. Um, <laughs> I try to make it good. I try to figure out what's the good part of it and why it's going to be good for me so I can override the brain part of telling me, what the hell are you doing? And, <laughs> But yeah, of course I, you know, come on, I'm not, I have all the, um, you know, you have, I, I mean, I, I don't have tremendous, you know, that it's not something I need or do all the time, but mm -hmm, I, I mm -hmm. do, I do partake in some foods or things that I, I absolutely regret the next day. Um, uh, but I think you need to do, I think that has, that's natural and it, it happens and anybody who tells you that they can be a hundred percent is, I'm going to say full of shit. Would you say um, that cheating like once a week is putting stress on your body? So it might not be the worst thing in the world. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're trying to talk yourself into <laughs> Um, uh, I, I, I'd say you're wrong, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I like, I like the way you're thinking and, and, and mentally, if you're thinking that, that might be a good thing. Um, uh, but no, it is all about efficient. It's like, okay. you got to think about it like a car, you know, a high, an engine that's a performance engine. If you put shitty gas in it, it's, it's not going to perform. And mm -hmm. it, it doesn't care about what tastes good or not. It's just, all, it's all about performance and about efficiency of that energy. And it's the same thing with what we put in our body. So mm -hmm. Um, we just have a body that's amazing and how it can, how it can <laughs> utilize different energy source substrates and, and actually get by. Um, so. so it's, it's tough to eat, right? We've all been there. You know, we were, especially the case when we're stuck at home, we're trying to eat right. Um, and it, it, we, we've said this on several other podcast episodes where this is a big problem. The food that we eat in the U S we have seventy percent of Americans are obese or overweight. It's it has a lot to do with the lack of exercise and the food choices. So I'm hoping that this helps people um, find some motivation, not just to be healthy if that doesn't motivate you, but to be optimized or, or to be acting and living your life in the most best way possible. It, it's a powerful message, and I hope I hope it, it, this helps because it's a, it's a struggle. We all deal with it, um, and I, I, I hope you find some some motivation here, knowing that it's not just about the health; it's about everything else. Um, one thing I want to end this uh, this episode on, Doc, is um, a fascinating tidbit that you told me while we were in the car in in, in Ohio, driving to our next video shoot. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, you were telling, I was, at, I was telling about my diet and my plateaus and you said, well, why are you doing the same thing all the time? I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, okay, see, I, I did intermittent fasting for a bit uh, in combination with low carb and you're like, I do 16 hours, 16 hours fast, eight hours in, I do 24 hours, I do two hours in, you know, 18 hours out. It's like, and my mind just blown. Like I'm just like I never thought to just vary the times, and it absolutely it makes sense. Um, and what you said about the body learning how to adapt, I don't think I will forget that. So it's <laughs> um, really great, great pieces of advice, Doc. Any any last words as we wrap up today? We didn't get to any of the questions I had from our listeners, but we will get to it tomorrow or the next episode. I promise I will make. I, I will start with that on the next episode. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope uh, so next time I think it would be good. I promise that I'll spend more time and talk about each mm -hmm. diet and, and we'll talk, I'll talk about what I like about each of them and really give some people some food for thought about how they can mix and mat, uh, match the uh, mix and what is the word I'm looking for? Match the uh, mm -hmm. match. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Mix and match. And yeah. 
And uh, yeah, because I think that's real important for people to understand that there, there is so many benefits to a lot of these and then you can take the benefits from each of them and make your own. Uh, other than that, um, I love when you ask me little things like that, that I can just pull things out and tell people that I like, you know, why I like the walnut stuff and yeah, just, just yeah. little things that I think are tidbits of information that are very powerful for people because they do make, they make a, they make a tremendous difference. And this is, again, this, this is food. We're just talking about food. And I think that I just want to keep hitting that point of why that can be so important. Um, I mean, just as we've learned food choices can get us into trouble, right? Because we have a epidemic of younger kids that are becoming diabetic because mm. of food choices. And the opposite goes the same way. If we make good food choices, good things can happen. So uh, I just think this is a great awareness time that it's so, it's, a, it's really a privilege to be here with you to keep talking about this because I think I really believe people are in a they're in a place now where they really want to hear these things and learn more about how they can empower themselves and that's what this is all about it's just it's just give me a little bit of knowledge and I'll take it further doc or I'll look it up and you know I'll I'll learn more myself and that's this is what's so fun with this and hopefully start to take a little action Today's episode should have been called Food, Drugs, and Epigenome. Uh, please take away <laughs> our, our, <laughs> our takeaways for this episode. Walk for 15 minutes after your meal, just once a day. That would be great. If you have a dog, take the dog out too. Um, <laughs> and well, we, we call that, that's comes from our pro, that comes from our pro-peptide lifestyle. That's something that we, you know, it's that walking again, you're producing, you don't know it, but you're producing myokines, which are peptides and things that are important in all these things we talk about. So that's our big pro peptide lifestyle push that we're really, we're fanatics about. So I think it's great you brought all that up. I don't know how we got to it. But I'm glad we did. <laughs> Somehow we made it here. Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, definitely check out Dr. Seeds' blog on seeds.md. Uh, you can navigate to his blog. Go to seeds.md slash blog. Um, we're here. Even though we didn't do it this episode, I promise next one we will spend time on answering your questions that you sent us. Info at seeds.md. It's not a dot .com. It's info at seeds.md. Even Dr. C's got it wrong on your last podcast. You were, you were being interviewed on national TV and you gave them the wrong freaking web address doc. <laughs> what, did I, what did I say? What did I say? You said seedsmd.com. Oh, no. It's okay. I'll forgive you this one time. Uh, I, yes. I actually, you know, to my, come to my defense, um, I don't ever Google myself, so I don't know. <laughs> yes. I mean, so so it's seeds dot dot m d. Okay, I got it now. Yeah, thank you. Yep, you're, you're welcome. Uh, so that is uh, where you can find us. Uh, it's also you can find us on social media. Uh, look for William A Seeds M D accounts. Uh, we will also be linking it out on YouTube. You can see this if you're if you're listening. We have a video version of this conversation that might be a little more engaging for you. Check us out on that YouTube channel. Um, look for William Seeds MD. That's where we will post the video version of this audio podcast. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Those of you who did, please keep in touch and we will see you folks next week. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Karen. <laughs>